this is towards the end of a series of online events being held this week. Um, and I'm looking forward to actually meeting some people face to face this afternoon. So a few of us have got to the to the uh, venue early and we're in various corners of this hall to make sure that we don't we don't get any feedback. So um, it's great to actually see people in person. But don't worry if you haven't missed if you missed if you haven't made those sessions and um, they are being recorded and they will be available on the Health Creation website from um, kind of November time. For colleagues who may be new to the Health uh, Creation Alliance, please think about joining if you haven't already. Um, it is free and you can play your part in spreading and advancing health creation. Um, there will be an evaluation at the end of, the, of this session. Um, this is my first event for the healthcare creation. So feed, all feedback is a gift, um, but it'd be great if you could uh, complete that. So a big thank you to our partners um, who are supporting these events. So that's PPL, Solis, South Central West, Novartis, NHS Property Services, HLM Architects, as well as the Health Creation Alliance patrons, Lord Victor Abdueli and Lord Nigel Crisp. So we, it's a real pleasure to work with these sponsors to bring these sessions together, and it wouldn't have been possible without, the, without them. And I hope you find this event timely and informative. So what we're aiming to do in this session is to kind of present progress, and I'm really delighted to be joined by colleagues who I've had the privilege of coming across during this journey to try and think about how the NHS can use more of its social and economic power. Um, and so what we're going to do is initially... Um, hear from their learning and experience, uh, particularly about thinking about how we support the social and economic goals of our communities, be that through recruitment, through our supply chain, through our strategic development and our capital. And then we'll broaden it out to a discussion about how this could support the fourth key aim of the, of the emerging ICSs of helping the NHS to support broader social and economic development and tackle um, the uh, underlying causes of health inequality. And really what I'm hoping, if I've done my job right, is by the end, we'll feel some form of peer support and a, and a, and a real um, call to action to really rally behind the health creation as a means to support the eradication of health inequality and a fight for social justice. So I hope that um, you enjoy the session, that you get an increased knowledge, but really what I'm looking for is really to help us challenge each other in a supportive way, but particularly, you know, I've spent all of my life in the NHS, and I think we forget that actually, um, if you look at healthy outcomes, um, about 15% of it is driven by what we do in, within the health service in terms of um, a kind of health, health treatment, and health provision. And, you know, 40 to 60% is done by what goes on in the community in terms of employment, sense of purpose, housing, etc. And I will be honest, I was 15, maybe even longer, years in service before I found that fact out. So there is something about how can we, particularly those of us who are kind of NHS through and through, how you can really help us open our eyes to really do what what health creation is about so i first came across health creation in, in january when i was invited to speak um, an event which led to a publication called how can nhs anchors support communities to create health learn to, to create um health uh, learnings from the pandemic which i think lee if by some magic is going to pop that in the chat just for those you may not come across that report and i kind of often sell, say at that point i kind of found a bit of a spiritual tribe it felt quite isolating sitting in the acute trust trying to really think about um, some of these things and i guess if i go on now to talk a little bit about what health creation is um so for, it's been going for seven years and it's a national movement to to create health creation and to address health inequalities. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Neil. And I've now, I thought that would happen, I've now lost my notes. So it started, um, things started moving quite slowly for the first four and a half years, but then COVID um, changed everything. And I guess it's m one of many destructive voice forces in our world today because it exposes the stark inequalities at the time making visible some of the more hidden aspects of how communities work but also enable communities to become more resilient and thrive by concentrating our minds on how inequalities can be addressed by creating the conditions for communities to come become stronger through connections so the last two and a half years have been very different the health creation experiencing what we're describing as a coming of age. It's undergoing a metamorphosis, but there's a, there's a lot more maturing still to do. 
So part of these series of events is to think about how health creation must become business as usual across all our systems and organisations in an effort to treat illness and prevent ill health. As we move into new phase where more broader partnerships and collaborations become more possible, our collective mission must be to build back together, including our poorest, most marginalised communities and increase our efforts to make the necessary change happen. So if we just flip on to the, to the next slide, please, Neil, this kind of talks a bit more about what health creation is. So as you see on the, on, on the slide, it's a process through which individuals and communities, and I really love these words, gain a sense of purpose, hope, mastery, and control over their lives. So it talks about the three C's of health creation, which is around contact, control, contact, and confidence. And hopefully throughout these presentations, you'll see some of those, um, those themes coming, coming, coming on board. So the health creation has developed a, a framework for health creation, which has been um, tested out through academic partners, funded through an NIHR grants that will kind of strengthen the evidence base. And um, so it really is at the forefront of, of learning and what works in health creation. So I guess just to move on to the, to the six features of a health creating practice, they're listening, truth telling, strength focusing, self-organizing, reciprocity, I can't say that word, I'll have to use give and get because um, that, that works for me, and power shifting. I think particularly in the work that I've been doing within a, an acute provider, really thinking about how do we move from that paternalistic way of medicine to think about how do you recognize people's strengths and expertise and how they are valued and how you do really do that shift power. So having introduced you to the health creation framework around creating the conditions, I'd now like to move on to the main substance of, of, of our time together. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce um, Tom Lloyd Goodwin, who's Director of Policy and Practice at Clare's, the Centre for Local Economic Strategy. So Tom's going to speak for about 10 minutes, really to provide the policy context for this work, thinking about the work he's, he's led around community wealth building. Please do add your um, questions, thoughts um, into the chat, um, as I hope we will have some time after Tom's talk to actually open it up to questions. So over to you, Tom. Thanks so much, Donna. Can you can you hear me all right? I'm a, I'm a good, brilliant. Yeah. So yeah. Morning, everyone. Real real pleasure to be here. So yeah, as, as Donna says, I'm I'm director of policy and practice at Clares, the Centre for Local Economic Strategies. If if you don't know us, if you've not heard of us, we're um, the national organisation for local economies. We're a think tank that's all about progressive economics for people, for place, and for planet. Um, we're key advocates, really, of, of the community wealth building agenda that which some of you might be familiar with in a health context though we're, we're probably best known for our work on anchor so many of you will have read the work that we did for the health foundation on the nhs as an anchor institution which of course uh, made it into the final paragraph of the long-term plan um claire's currently runs an nhs community practice of which some of you here today will be members um we're also excitedly currently working with uh, bedford luton and milton Keynes ics on the development of an anchors action plan um, and health and wealth creation really is a big theme within within Claire's work and it's going to be a big theme of our kind of our new business plan that we'll be kind of releasing here in the next couple of months so today you know we're, obviously we're talking about this idea of creating health by supporting broader social and economic development we're thinking about what anchors can do in this space what else needs to happen and I suppose to this end, I'll, I'll kind of get into three things today. I'll start with a bit of context setting, a bit of kind of policy context. I'll then talk about community wealth building and anchor institutions. I'll explain the link between the two. And then I'll finish briefly with some points about impact and about how this approach can really start to address health inequalities and be used as a driver to improve uh, population health. So let me start with, with context then, and this, this idea of, um, I suppose, creating uh, and supporting broader health and social uh, and economic development is, is of course, um, it's, it's a key objective now for, for ICSs in England, uh, but it's what leading uh, provider trusts have been on with for a while. It's what kind of health systems have been on with for a while. Um, but as I'm going to explain uh, in, my, in my talk, uh, now is the time really to start kicking things 
up a gear. So we're at a moment, of course, of profound economic, social and environmental crisis. We've got record numbers of people in the UK now living in poverty. Life expectancy has recently stalled for the first time in a century. Uh, we've seen big rises in destitution with the latest data showing uh, that more than a million households experienced destitution in 2019, with modelling suggesting additional increases during the pandemic. Um, this is all set to get worse, of course, with the current cost of living crisis. And whilst we might have avoided this um, once in a generation explosion in poverty due to the introduction of the energy price cap freeze, uh, we know that kind of more than a million people will still be pushed into poverty this winter. And many people are going to face not just the choice between uh, heating and eating, but actually simply being unable to afford either. Um, as we move into what looks like an inevitable recession, consumer spending starts to fall, we're going to risk cascading unemployment, beginning in retail and hospitality, uh, with an economic impact that could unfortunately potentially eclipse that of the 2008 uh, financial crash. In addition to all of this, we've also got the, the climate crisis and environmental breakdown, which of course is escalating rapidly. Uh, latest reports point to the fact that temperature changes are happening faster um, and the likelihood is that the world will re that, reach that tipping point sooner than had been originally forecast. So yeah, we need emergency interventions right now to mitigate against all of these, these impacts. Uh, we've seen some uh, action, of course, here on, on the cost of living crisis with the energy price cap freeze. Energy, of course, is still unaffordable, though, for, for many, many people, and we need arguably more action here. But in addition to these kind of macro kind of government interventions, um, we need kind of we also need long term change and, and our economic model, our approach to local economic development also needs a fundamental reset. And it's this idea then of a reset that I want to talk to uh, today. So let me move on to talk about the role of community wealth building here, uh, the importance of anchor institutions how these two concepts relate to each other and how uh, this can then impact health inequalities and population health. Um, so first, you know, there's, a, there's always a tendency here to think, well, what's that got to do with the NHS? Well, you know, Donna was alluding to it uh, before, you know, across its wide range of, of services, the NHS's mission, of course, extends beyond making us better when, when, when we're ill. It's also about making sure that we don't fall ill in the first place, playing a key role in those wider social economic and environmental determinants of health. And in this, um, large institutions like hospitals, of course, are important drivers of, of local economic activity. So they spend hundreds of millions of pounds each year, they employ thousands of people, and they often hold other significant assets such as, such as surplus land. So harnessing these assets for positive social, economic, and environmental effect is a key tenant or aspect of what we commonly refer to as community wealth building. So at CLES, we, we define community wealth building as a progressive approach to economic development. It's about trying to change the way that our economy is <coughs> by aiming to retain more wealth and opportunity for the benefit of local people. And this really contrasts to our mainstream economic model, whereby economic growth tends to be quite exclusive, Large amounts of wealth have been created by property ownership. Urban regeneration is typically based on, on speculative property development. And there's a tendency for large companies to extract wealth from our local economies for the benefit of distant shareholders. And yes, while this approach to kind of economics and economic development has, has produced strong GDP growth figures over the, over the last few decades, where growth has, has roughly doubled since the 1980s, and some people have benefited well from this, um, the proceeds and benefits of this growth have not been felt more widely. So it's just some kind of some basic statistics around this. At the latest count, the wealthiest 10 percent of households in the UK hold 43 percent of all the wealth in the country. And that contrasts to the bottom 50 percent that hold only 9 percent of that wealth. Or another statistic for you, the richest households, which is five households in the UK, own more wealth than 13.2 million people. Um, when it comes to jobs, again, traditional approaches to, to economic development are not delivering, arguably, with low, <laughs> low wages um, dominating the headlines. Um, despite recent stories about shortages and bottlenecks being good for workers um, across the, the majority of the private sector, 
uh, at least we're, we're facing falling real pay. This is compounding the current cost of living crisis and the impact of rising inflation. Um, this is having a detrimental impact and consequence for worker health and well-being. Work is becoming less effective at, at warding off poverty, with record numbers of people now experiencing in-work poverty. Um, is, is everyone on mute, by the way? I'm, I'm just hearing a few, few coughs. If everyone could just mute, that would be that would be brilliant. Um, so what community wealth building is trying to do then is, is, is really reverse this trend that we're seeing, this, tr this trend of kind of negative statistics within our, our economic development. And it's, it's, about, it's, it's trying to do this in part, at least by harnessing the economic, social and environmental power of locally rooted institutions. And this is where the idea of anchor institutions come in. So we, we call these locally rooted institutions anchor institutions or anchors. Typically, this means local councils, hospitals, universities, colleges, housing associations, potentially the private sector too, if there can be some compromise between that um, drive for profit uh, and more uh, kind of, you know, more looking at those kind of additional uh, social and economic drivers as well. And so used in the right way, kind of everyday practices such as anchor spending, employment, how, how anchors use land can have a significant impact for local economies. So let me just kind of talk briefly about a few key interventions here. Um, I'll, for brevity, I'll just focus on, on um, employment and spend. Um, I'll talk about the cutting edge of, of what's going on. So if we take spend as an example, what we're seeing, I'll, 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 I'll reflect health in this as, as well, but let me just kind of start by talking about local government. So councils like Fife, Luton, Carmarthenshire are starting to take everyday functions like procurement and they're bringing this into their economic development department. And essentially they're using their own uh, procurement expenditure as, as a mechanism to grow and diversify their local SME base and you know, support local businesses essentially. And what we're seeing is, is economic development officers engaging with local SMEs to make them more aware of, of, of their goods and services pipeline with a view to getting those SMEs to deliver more of that goods and services pipeline. They're also using this as an opportunity to address the environmental crisis, so supporting local SMEs with retrofit, with access to environmental grants. They're encouraging those SMEs to pay the real living wage. They're also initiating discussions around succession planning. So if, if the owners of businesses are coming to retirement age, it could be about you know, encouraging those businesses to maybe transition to a worker ownership model. But what all of this is doing is in addition to that kind of desire for businesses to make profit, it's also enabling those businesses to grow and develop with greater social and environmental purpose. And brilliantly, fantastically, we're seeing health getting involved here too. So we've recently done a bit of analysis for the Northern Care Alliance, helping them to identify where their influenceable spend might be so that they can go to council partners and say, look, here's some more demand within the economy that could potentially go to local businesses. Um, in our work with Bedfordshire Luton and Milton Keynes ICS uh, on their Anchors Action Plan, we're also looking them to get them to partner with Luton Council again, in a similar way so that the local authority can help direct that expenditure towards local businesses and do some of the heavy lifting. You know, we know that it's difficult within procurement departments, particularly in the NHS at the moment. You know, there's not a lot of staff there. You know, there's not a lot of, not a staff with that kind of wider economic development expertise. But, you know, local government can help there. And I'll come on to that more in a moment when I talk about ICSs, of course. Um, but just on employment, before we get there, we've seen some great uh, pioneers here on employment, you know, lots of people in the room today, what the Northern Care Alliance are doing around targeting jobs towards people and communities who need them the most. Uh, Mid and South Ethics are doing great work, really looking forward to hearing from Kevin here talk about that. Um, then at the ICS level, we're seeing programmes like ICANN at the Birmingham and Solihull ICS, very similar to what Northern Care Alliance are doing around linking jobs in the NHS to pre-employment training, getting rid of that advert and interview process and offering and combining that with very targeted pre-employment support. Um, I suppose, in, 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 and this is where it gets interesting, in terms of, of how this activity is then starting to be elevated and I suppose the opportunity to elevate, we're increasingly seeing um, councils start to modify their local economic strategies to incorporate more of a community wealth building approach. So Wigan, Islington, Newham uh, have already done this. 
Um, we at CLAS are currently working with Newcastle City Council. We're working with Ayrshire Region in Scotland to kind of draft fully fledged inclusive economy strategies that are about incorporating community wealth building and thinking more about using place based assets like expenditure, employment, and land to drive a different kind of more inclusive economic activity that's not just about inward investment or high growth sectors, but it's about the everyday economy, about the economy that makes a difference to, to many people's lives. And this, I think, is where there's a real opportunity to kick things up a gear. And it's through that partnership working between local government and the NHS, which is, is of course, is being, being enabled more through the new ICS structure. And I think, you know, just blue sky thinking it a bit, and, and I'm sure this is going on to, to an extent already, but, you know, potentially we should be able to see the alignment of strategic plans within the ICS at the ICP, uh, the partnership level, and then rollout of progressive practice through the ICB, the Integrated Care Board, with a view to delivering more of these community wealth building interventions at scale. You know, so if the strategic stuff at the ICP is about improving population health, then you know, can we drive start to drive interventions through the ICB, um, taking those assets like expenditure, uh, surplus land, employment opportunities, and driving them through the economy for greater social, economic and environmental impact. Um, OK, so let, that brings me to the final thing that I want to talk about briefly just before I throw it open to questions, and that is this idea of impact then. You know, how can these approaches truly address health inequalities and improve population health? Um, on the one level, I guess, it should be self-evident, right? You know, more money for local businesses, jobs for people who need them the most, using surplus land to build affordable housing, all of these things, right? affect and impact the social determinants of health. We know that to be true, and we know that that keeps people healthy. Um, to get more specific though, I know we all love numbers and, and kind of like solid interventions that, we, that we've got evidence for. You know, I'm, I'm currently a co-applicant on an NIHR grant with the University of Liverpool, uh, with UCLAN, which is about evaluating the work that CLES did in Preston with a group of anchor institutions, whereby those anchor institutions adopted a suite of community wealth building interventions, like redirecting public expenditure towards local SMEs, uh, cooperative social enterprises, paying the real living wage across the groups of anchor institutions, um, using land to build affordable housing, some of you might have heard of that. It was dubbed the Preston model. Um, what's less well known, though, is actually that the, that the rollout of these interventions has correlated with uh, improvements in socioeconomic deprivation since those community wealth building interventions were rolled out. And actually what we've discovered in our, in our kind of more detailed evaluation is that during the period since community wealth building has been introduced, there have been fewer mental health problems in Preston compared to, to other similar areas. So we've used some modeling called difference in difference, which is like a, it's like a kind of a quasi uh, randomized control trial that you do with modeling. And, and it's very kind of helpful for evaluating programs and interventions in the real world. So it's established uh, that link, which is which is really great. And so there's an early imprint of that of that paper available that I, that I can share in, in the chat. Um, we've also we've just submitted it to the Lancet Journal of Public Health for peer review. So some real tangible evidence here of what these community wealth building, these anchor interventions can achieve. I should say also that Michael Wood and I, Michael Wood, who's also here today, are also co-ops on another NIHR grant looking specifically at employment interventions within an NHS context. So once the health economists have started to run some of the modeling, um, I'd be very surprised if we don't start to see some more detailed positive evidence here too, in light of you know all of that progressive stuff that's that's been happening already. So I hope that's been informative. Um, the NHS, I suppose in conclusion, the NHS has kind of been collectively dipping its toes into the waters of, of community wealth building and, and the anchors agenda for some time now. And yes, there's been you know some fantastic early adopters of good practice. But I suppose with the new ICS structure in England, there is a real uh, opportunity now for the NHS uh, to dive right in, to clumsily continue that metaphor around war and, and to really kind of help build more inclusive economies for people, for place and for planet. Uh, I'll leave it there, but thanks so much, everyone, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tom. That was a really helpful introduction to try and place this conversation within the, the policy context and the work that you've done. Um, I've just just to pick up this kind of three questions in the chat. So just to keep the flow, I'm just wondering, um, you kind of was answering Brian's question as he was typing in terms of how do we measure this? So I don't know if you, Brian, is there anything else you want to bring in on your question um, just for Tom? 
Um, thanks. Well, I think I think Tom did talk about the impact on health, which is, I guess, the most important from our health creation point of view. Um, but do we have any data on the financial and employment impact of these kinds of things? Because they are the social determinants there. They will matter as much as anything else. Yeah, I mean, there is. There, I mean, we're, we're, we're starting to kind of, I suppose, bake it more into the into the kind of action planning stuff that we're doing. So we've developed a whole range of, of metrics around, um, yeah, economic indicators, kind of social and environmental too. So looking at, yeah, that would, so that would be looking at kind of like, yeah, you would want to look overall at GDP, GVA, but you would also look at number of jobs created, number of living wage jobs created. Um, you'd want to look at kind of, you know, number of SMEs created, number of um, kind of social enterprise cooperatives, kind of trying to measure all of that. Unfortunately, we're not, we're not, I suppose, at a stage where that that's become implemented practice just yet. So I, I'm hoping that those kind of statistics will follow through, like certainly with what we're doing with, with um, Bedfordshire Luton and Keynes ICS, we're, we're giving them a set of indicators, which we hope that they'll start to be able to kind of more thoroughly measure this with. Uh, but yeah, because it's not, people haven't been routinely collecting that data in relation to this agenda. There's not loads of stuff out there. So that's that's why with this NIHR grant, we're having to, having to kind of use this quasi trial methodology, which is, you know, modeling it all out. But yeah, I, I'm, I think the more that this becomes common practice, the more that people will start to measure that and the more data we'll have them, the more, the better quality of evidence we'll be able to get about the success of these kinds of interventions. I mean, Brian, I think for me, there's something as simple as big organisations just publishing who do they employ and where do they live? So how many of your um, uh, jobs are going to local people? You know, particularly for the big organisations where, you know, certainly I can speak for Northern Care Alliance, we know that we're the major employer in some of our localities and just publishing that data and starting a conversation to say, how come we employ some people from this ward, but not from this ward? Actually, what's going on there? Because actually that says more about us as an organisation, not about those communities and how you can build those um, kind of connections through the, um, you're using the kind of three C's that we talk about with health creation. Mm -hmm. I'm conscious there's kind of one really key, which I think is a bit of a killer question that I think I'm going to put to, to all presenters from Asmina, which is why don't the community know about this? So top warning to all of the presenters. I think that's really important about how do we, it kind of goes back to that truth telling, how do we tell this in a way and engage with our communities to do this work? So we're not just doing that reverting to NHS type that will do this to you how do we do this with and how do we enable communities to do it for um mm. so I don't know Tom, <laughs> any reflections on that or maybe yeah that I think that would be a really helpful theme for to pull out I do yeah I can offer some, some brief reflections now I think why don't the community know about it I think because despite the name community wealth building um it is the starting point for it is kind of about institutional economics so how you take the power of big institutions to, to start to kind of use their assets in a more transformative way having said that certainly in in the thinking and doing that we're on with at the moment we're and in the formulation of kind of like new economic plans for areas we're saying this shouldn't just be local government deciding this it should be actually all of the anchors too and actually the community as well you need a proper engagement process where you know you go in out and talking to people and say you know and donna you've done some great work on this as well at northern carolina it's actually under and, and that's what's made that program employment program successful is because you've taken the time to understand what people's actual needs are and i think that needs to follow through now into economic planning it needs to follow through into the strategic plans at the icp level within ics's you know that needs to be cognizant of what communities and people actually need in this space and i think we've got to do that um engagement piece and get that right as well so i think that's it starts in institutional economics but you know it's it should it should look to bring the community in its wider sense into it and that's really how should, they should get to find out about it i think that's great thanks tom can i just bring we've got a hand up um is it muscat sorry i never know with which way around first names are so apologies if i've got that wrong no it is Mustak. thank you very much and uh, I'm, uh, I'm got lucky and I got the email. I'm not supposed to be here, but thank you. And inequality in health and the wealth 
It's data is there for last 10 years. We're not going up, we're going down. Food banks are there. Winters are coming. Utility bills are coming. And the uh, our income are shrinking. We all know that. But I'm, you know, you may, I'm from a lived experience in mental health. I rep I'm a governor of the trust. I represent service user in the council of the governor. I do a lot of work. But one thing I see is we brought 24 seven helpline in Birmingham through NHS England, they gave us the money. One of the best thing happened in pandemic, you can call that number, that's positive. I see us, we are in a crossroad. If we use community, people, social prescription, if I'm holding walking group, we need to back in a community, the wealth creating, not a clinical level, social prescription is use the community to produce wealth in the community. Another thing I want to ask you, Tom, you know, NHS, a lot of building are, they are shut down, not doing the standing. We can use those yeah. facilities to build the communities. So thank you. That's all I want to share. Thank you. I think you're spot on. I think we, it's this, you know, you walk past the hospital and the doors are shut and the lights are off and we've got community groups that we know are not going to be able to carry on because they can't afford to heat yeah. community buildings, whatever. So we are, COVID didn't help because we had to close down our, our sites. So we are really starting that conversation, certainly I know within my own organisation, a lot of NHS organisations around things like how do we keep our, restaurants and canteens open at weekends. We notoriously close them at weekends. So if you're doing the late shift on a Sunday, you can't get hot food unless you're using a, um, a you know, like a, you know, a, a, what should we call it? That, that thing in the cupboard that's not a proper food. And um, whereas actually we know, actually if we engage with our community, we could actually create a community kitchen. So that's certainly something that we're we're looking at. But I, I do agree, it's how do, that how does a hospital facilities become part of the community rather than just where you go when you're visiting somebody in hospital and that's a step change I think I think for both so it's a shame you're in Birmingham and not in Oldham because there's loads we could do so um yeah thank you for that Tom would you like to uh, if you any other examples of where you know people are opening up yeah I mean, yeah obviously for time I, I didn't get on to kind of land use and you know there is the, the, the a big scale there's the potential to do affordable housing but yeah you know you, you're dead right there is there is that kind of letting groups use um use kind of hospital premises for free i i, I think as i understand it I'm, I'm i think the university of birmingham have done stuff around that actually letting community opening up their kind of conferencing facilities for, for local charities and 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 community groups yeah i mean i think there's you know where hospitals can they they you know they ought to be doing that it's a shame that they have to be you know we we, we mustn't you know we mustn't put the responsibility for the creation of this at you know, health stores you know it's we need to hold our politicians feet to the fire over this if, if if you know if there's not enough resource for communities and similarly if you know if we haven't opened up our hospitals for warm spaces something's going fundamentally wrong there that needs addressing uh, and we mustn't forget to kind of hold government's feet to the fire on that. And Merrin's just put in the chat that there is a report going to be published by Health Creation Alliance on creating spaces for wellbeing for NHS properties um, earlier this week so there may be some relevance to this discussion here. And um, Kevin are you going to take um, speaker's prerogative and, and ask a question of another speaker over to you Kevin? No I was actually just going to offer a piece of work that's available uh, in its phase one report from the Voluntary Community Sector Alliance, um, which is the way nationally that the ICS has a discussion with the voluntary community sector about community anchors. And it's at phase two, so it's by locality. And I'm, yeah, it's a personal preference, but actually if we're opening the doors to the discussion with communities, doing that through this, the, the pathways that are there, I think is a really important potential for a step forward. And, and you know what, surprise, surprise, they're interested in all the same things that we are as, as a statutory part of a system. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a good read and phase two, I will look forward to. It just didn't quite get the geographical coverage it needed at first, first trance. Thanks, Kevin. Tom, any final thoughts from you before I hand over to our next speaker? Um, just that I think, just to reiterate, I think there is 
a real opportunity within the new ICS structure to kind of to to really kick this up a gear and and um yeah I think it's 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 trying to do it's trying to align those those plans between the ICP and, and then the delivery through the ICB. I think there there is there's a lot there's a lot more we could be doing in that space. Um, so yeah, I think it's exciting um, and look for, looking forward to see what what people kind of what people start to do. So yeah, but thanks thanks so much, Donna, and yeah, really enjoyed Thank that. You, Tom. Great. Thanks for your time. Um, so um, we're now going to move on to some areas of practice um, and just just for colleagues, just to hold on to those questions that were in the chat. One was around scale up. So how do we scale up some of this? And again, that killer question, how why don't our communities know about this and how are we involved in communities? So so we're, we're just to, just, you know, nothing like you've prepared a speech and then someone throws in two more questions at you. So mm -hmm. so I'm sure you can nimbly uh, weave that in. So I'm delighted to invite colleagues from um, East London NHS Foundation Trust. Um, I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves and really to talk about how they've used uh, their journey, their trust journey in becoming a Marmot Trust and that link between Marmot and Anchor. Again, they'll speak for, for 10 minutes and we should be able to open it up for, for questions. So over to you, colleagues. Hi, hi, Roshini. So we've got you on. You're on mute, Roshini. Thank you. Or actually, we or we can't hear you, unfortunately. So do you perhaps want to just revert back to yeah without the speakers? That would be great. Hello, is that better? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, just a big thank you to Donna and the Health Creation Alliance really for inviting us here today to talk about our journey as an NHS Foundation Trust uh, towards becoming a Marmot Trust. My name is Roshni Janarthanen and I'm a public health registrar, a doctor by background at uh, the East London NHS Foundation Trust and Una. Hello everyone, I'm a public health registrar at East London Foundation Trust as well. Thanks, Una. Um, and we'll be talking to you today about how we've worked with the Institute of Health Equity uh, to be an, a Marmot Trust. Uh, so if we could have the slides, Neil, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Uh, so the aims of our session today are really to give you an overview of our Marmot Trust programme of work and our journey to date. Uh, and I'll be handing over to Una to discuss the relationship between the anchor and Marmot approaches, and also to reflect on our learning so far, um, as we've been on this journey for about a year now. Next slide, please. Great, so uh, this is our Marmot Trust journey to date. Uh, so we'll start firstly by just doing a brief recap of the Marmot principles. Um, so some or many of you may know already, uh, that Professor Sir Michael Marmot was asked by the Department of Health in 2008 to chair an independent review to identify evidence-based ways to reduce health inequalities in England. And a report was published in 2010 entitled Fair Society, Healthy Lives. And this report concluded that action on six policy objectives was needed to reduce health inequalities and we refer to these as the Marmot Principles. In recent years, there have been two more additions to these principles. Um, the principles are listed here, uh, but roughly speaking, they relate to giving children the best start in life and control over their lives, creating good work and a good standard of living, giving importance to prevention and sustainability, and the two new principles relate to tackling discrimination and also um, pursuing climate change and sustainability, environmental sustainability together. Next slide, please. So how did we decide to become an, a Marmot Trust? So just a little bit of background about East London NHS Foundation Trust. We are a community and mental health trust, and we operate in East London boroughs, as the name suggests. So Tower Hamlets, Newham, and City in Hackney. But we also operate outside of London in Bedford and Luton, and we also provide services in Richmond. So we do cover a wide geographical area. 
We as a trust were aware of a growing network of marmot places, so towns and cities such as Greater Manchester, Coventry and Luton, that were working with UCL Health Institute of Health Equity, so that's Professor Marmot's team, to ensure that health equity is prioritised and embedded in everything that these places do. Uh, so our chief executive last year in summer 2021 uh, had a discussion with Professor Marmot and that's where the idea of being a Marmot Trust was born. So an NHS organization which prioritizes health equity and taking action on the Marmot principles in everything that we do. So at the same time that this discussion happened, our five-year strategy was also being refreshed. So with senior buy-in, we actually included improved population health as one of our key strategic outcomes. And then we also developed specific objectives around this strategic outcome, which were based on the Marmot principles. So next slide, please. So this gives you an idea of how these principles have been embedded into our strategy as an organization. So we have the strategic outcome on the left here uh, that's highlighted. So as you can see, it makes up one of only four strategic outcomes. So it's a significant chunk of the strategy. And the specific objectives, which I think are too small to see here, but I can assure you that they're based on and firmly linked to the Marmot principles that we went over um, on the previous slide. Next slide, please. So in terms of how we wanted to work to become a Marmot Trust, we are currently working with the UCL Institute of Health Equity. And we are aiming to test the boundaries of what an NHS organization can and should do to stop lives being cut short by working towards the building blocks of good health and um, also uh, referred to as the social determinants of health. So working towards stable jobs, good pay and quality housing for our service users, amongst other things, um, and also other members of the communities we serve. So this is about working more upstream to ensure that the right building blocks are in place to improve population health and therefore reduce inequalities. Next slide, please. Um, so this is an example really of work that we were already doing as a trust. Um, when we first uh, integrated the Marmot principles into our trust strategy, we realized that actually against a lot of these principles, or as we now call them strategic objectives, we were actually already doing quite a lot of work as a trust that could be considered work against these objectives. So we mapped all the work that we were already doing as a trust against these objectives. And some of that work is the work that you can see here. We've also added in some work that is new work, um, which uh, has stemmed from the Marmot program. Some highlights here that I'd just like to point out. Under um, supporting service users, carers and communities we serve to access employment, we have recruited 112 service users at Health over the past two years. We also have 175 current apprentices at Health. I'd also like to say that we do have over 15 service users in our trust-wide employment steering group, which is a great way of involving our community. We also um, have been uh, championing social justice and uh, in terms of our uh, work towards this, our people and culture team have been working very hard uh, to look at projects to address inequalities, both within our organization, but also within the voluntary and community sector in the areas that we serve. So 1.8 million pounds of grant funding has been issued to voluntary and community sector organizations uh, in the last year. And we are also an NHS England early implementer site for tobacco control for people with serious mental illness. And that's one of the ways we're looking to uh, really prioritize prevention and early detection of illness in disadvantaged groups. Uh, and I think I just saw something pop in the chat. Pop in the chat. Uh, yeah, very happy to. I think the slides will be will be coming around to everyone, so um, you can have a look at the slide. Uh, next slide, please. So thanks very much. Uh, I'll just be handing over to Una and I for the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Rashni. So in addition to that existing work that was already going on at ELFT that maps onto Marmot principles, we also set up two place-based pilot programs to um, 
pilot this, this idea of becoming a Marmot Trust. So next slide, please. So essentially, IHE, Professor Marmot's team, advised that we pick just a few of those principles to really narrow our focus and, and be able to, to get started on it. So we picked the, the three principles outlined there, giving every child the best start in life, enabling all children, young people and adults to maximize their capabilities and have control over their lives and create fair employment and good work for all. So we chose two of ELF's localities um, to undertake pilot programs in Newham in East London, where the focus is on implementing the first two Marmot principles above. And that, that was because we have child-focused services in Newham, um, both mental health and physical health services. So that aligned with those two principles. We also chose Luton as the other pilot site because Luton was already working with the Institute of Health Equity to become a Marmot town. And that involves commissioning them to review the evidence um, for what's causing health inequalities and making a series of recommendations to address them. So we were able to harness that synergy and work with um, the council on the, the third principle there about creating fair employment and good work for all. We also took a QI approach from the outset um, with these two pilot programs. QI, quality improvement, is a key focus and strength at ELFT, and we have a dedicated QI team at the Trust. We're also a partner organization with the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, which was originally founded in the US 30 years ago. It now operates worldwide to use and teach QI methods to improve healthcare. So next slide, please. As Roshni said, we've been on this journey now to become the first Marmot Trust in the country for a year. So this is a, a timeline of, of our work over the past year. So starting over here in September 2021, as Roshni said, the beginning of all of this was integrating the Marmot principles into our trust strategy. We then set up a steering group which meets bi-monthly and it has internal senior leaders, both corporate and clinical, as well as external partners. So particularly um, the directors of public health from Newham and Luton local authorities and public health officers. In January of this year, we had a visit from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and they advised us on the approach to take and what they really emphasized was to have a bias to action. Um, so following that meeting, we, we jumped into some roundtable events for both Luton and Newham. Um, in February was the Luton event and March, the roundtable event for Newham was held. These were the launch events um, for, for external partners and internal partners in those local authorities. And what we did was generate ideas for our vision as a Marmot Trust in both of those areas and potential actions that we could take in line with that vision. So following the roundtable events, we held project development workshops in April in Luton and in June in Newham. And we, from the ideas for actions that were generated at the roundtables, partners voted on priority areas to take forward as an initial focus. And they also generated ideas for projects to take the priorities forward. So um, from the project development workshop in Luton, in August, we launched our first quality improvement project as part of this work on inclusive recruitment. And that reflects one of the priorities that was chosen by partners, which is to promote access to employment and apprenticeships at ELFT for disadvantaged groups. So we're working very closely with Luton Borough Council and their employability programme, um, which supports a range of adult learners in the population facing barriers to entry to the labour market um, to, to get healthcare support workers at the Trust. And we've actually had the first person successfully offered a role this week. So next slide, please. And again. 
So I'll just cover the the overlap between the anchor and the marmot approaches. Um, the policy aims of the two approaches are the same. It's to improve health and reduce health inequalities in the communities we serve. However, the, the perspectives on policy implementation are different. So the anchor organization approach, which Tom has outlined already for us, has the perspective of the individual organization at its core. So as he said, it's institutional economics. So how can an institution use their assets to support the community that they, in which they're located? Um, whereas the marmot place approach, so the marmot towns and cities, that's a very much a place based perspective and the recommendations from Professor Marmot were originally designed for implementation by local, regional and national governments. So next slide please. So the, the seminal 2019 Health Foundation report on the, the role of the NHS as an anchor institution outlined five key ways in which NHS organizations can act as anchors to support the welfare of their local communities. These are outlined here on the slide. And prior to our Marmot Trust initiative, the focus of our anchor program had been on the four pillars of procurement for local benefit, widening access to employment at the trust, using buildings and land to support communities and improving sustainability um, in our activities. So those were the four pillars of our anchor approach at the trust, very much focused on how we can use the functions and assets within ELF to support the local community in terms of health and wealth. And the, what the Marmot Trust approach has allowed us to do is to focus more on working with partners, particularly the local authorities in Luton and Newham. So to go beyond the bounds of our organisation um, and engage in more place-based work to address social determinants of health. Next slide, please. And again. So just to conclude, um, it's been a year now that we've been on this journey to become the first Marmot Trust in the country. And our key learning so far um, in terms of what have been our strengths is starting at that point of integrating the Marmot principles into our five-year ELF strategy. That has allowed us to have strong buy-in and interest at senior levels in the organization from the outset. As I've just outlined, it's helped us to have a stronger focus on place-based partnership working because previously our implementation perspective was more organizational with the Anchor program. We've used a QI approach, which helps us to optimize project delivery. Um, involving service users is a key strength at ELFT, and they, they have been involved in our groups, uh, working groups and steering groups. And we've had an effective soft communication strategy, engaging and meeting with staff across the organization. In terms of our key challenges, um, the place based approach is it has proved more challenging in relation to a population group. So children and young people in Newham, as compared to addressing employment in Luton as a determinant of health. That's been far more straightforward. Our role as an NHS organization and how we can influence employment in the local community is it's more straightforward to see. And with the place-based approach, at times we focused more on bringing external stakeholders along with us than internal stakeholders, but you really need to focus on, on both um, for success. And finally, it's been, of course, challenging to ensure that the work is prioritised by other teams um, due to capacity pressures. So that's it from us. Apologies, we're a couple minutes over time. Thank you, Una. Thank you, Oshin. That was uh, that was a really good presentation insight into what you're doing. Um, I'm just going to try and squeeze in a question um, from Ashmina because I think you put a few in there and I think this is the point that if we were together I could see you all naturally gravitating to coffee together because there was a few 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 uh, uh, questions in the chat so Ashmina would you like to um, pop yourself on unmute and ask your question thank you so much it has been really interesting um, listening to everybody 
uh, having worked in Tower Hamlet, so I know exactly what is going on there. But there are a couple of things I really wanted to ask. There's a lot of things going on at Bow with social prescribing. Are you interacting with, with that group? Because they are doing national work as well. Um, the other one was measuring social values, because I'm really interested in social values. How do you do that? The, the last question is connected with service users. I, as a service user, have stopped giving my data to anybody who asks me for it. So I was just wondering how you are em employing them or uh, taking them on board. Um, and really what sort of questions you are asking. So thank you, I'll stop at that. Thank you. And maybe the bit might be a bit of an email exchange so that you can maybe follow up some of that in detail, but if there's any immediate comments you want to give Una. Yeah, and um, so Bromley by Bow Centre, yes, they're absolutely doing fantastic work. Um, I've been leading on the work in Luton, so unfortunately they're they're not a partner we can engage in in Luton. Um, in so I'll move on then to your second question about measuring social values. So we use the social value portal. Um, I don't I don't know if you've come across that, but that's um, for our work on implementing social value in procurement and contract delivery. That's the, the platform we're using now. Um, and then in terms of service user involvement, and I think the, the previous question about um, why don't communities know about this? That's something we're really trying to focus on, and we're actually holding an anchor engagement event on the 11th of November, where the, the purpose is to bring service users, as well as staff across the organisation who aren't just in strategy roles, together so we can get their input on what our anchor programme should look like going forward over the next three years. So that's, that's something we, we really want to focus on going forward. But please, please do drop us an email um, to, to continue the conversation. That's great. Thank you. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm just going to it's going to move us on. But there are some questions in the chat. If you wouldn't mind just um, putting a quick response to or, or following up, that would be that would be great. So just just continue this theme of, of local employment. I'm going to ask Kevin. Um, from Mid and South Essex NHS Foundation Trust to share their approach to local employment through our anchor approach to local employment. So, Kevin, over to you. Um, thank you, Donna, and great to be here, folks. I think I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. Oh, there we are. Um, that, that's absolutely great. Um, I won't re-rehearse some of the, the, the theoretical part about anchor, uh, excepting to say that Mid and South Essex is that area that's immediately adjacent to East London in particular. So Basildon, Chelmsford, South End Hospitals, we also cover uh, the unitary authority of Thurrock and we go as far up as the Suffolk Cambridgeshire border. So there are some areas of our patch that are incredibly wealthy and incredibly rural. The point I actually wanted to make about the, the sense of permanency and public sector or community anchors is very much about what we call their sticky capital. Uh, and that sense that actually particularly hospitals in my world at least, they are really important places in our community. Um, whether the care is good, quick, excellent, indifferent, not great, people value those hospitals as equally they value GP surgeries, as equally as they value primary schools. Uh, and you can sense that because proposals are always to change the service and to close or have a major change in purpose for many of those buildings and activities is often a, a fraught and challenging process for everybody concerned. But actually from a Mid-South Essex perspective, and we know that because as coming together as the three hospitals three years ago, one of the propositions was we would have a singular AME uh, and emergency department and that fairly rapidly um, was taken off of the table. But we employ about 20,000 people and we spend 45 million pounds locally and, and I'll discuss some of that in a social value slide 
uh, a bit later on. But if we can have the next slide on and I'll um, try to, I'm not going to sort of rehearse all the lines that are, are there. What I'm going to talk about is some of the feeling and emotion and statistics that went underneath our approach. So very broadly, our approach around local employment and more widely about employment is about inclusion and about us wanting to be as a trust, a place where all can progress and innovate and thrive at an anchor level. So those are implications and written into both our strategy and our people plan. But actually at an anchor level, that's interpreted through activation and engaging of people and communities that are most at risk of limited life chances. Many of the people we work with will have had fractured education, fractured families, fractured working lives. Some good, some bad, but they will all face probably challenging circumstances. And it's about acting intentionally in support of those cohorts so that we avoid this sense of getting left behind. Um, and a lot of the work certainly talks to some of those principles, to use a political phrase, um, about levelling up that, that sense of place and community. But it's also for us about saying we need help as, as an acute trust. We don't have necessarily the skills or the knowledge to be able to do that on our own. And for us, it's been very much about working in partnership with those people that can provide that support and help us on our journey. And it becomes a more collective journey in so doing. So there are some messages. They're about taking time and commitment. Um, this doesn't happen overnight. You need the support of your boards and included in that your um, non-exec directors. So we have a dedicated anchor lead as a non-exec director and his support um, is instrumental to our progress. But we also need support from our broader workforce and managers, and as Colleague quite rightly pointed out, our wider, broader community sector in that. So messaging that and engaging at many different levels is an important part of our progress. But above all, it's about action and activity. When we first consulted in 2019 about what did an anchor program look like with partners, it was very much do some stuff, guys. And actually, we were very fortunate. Our, our former chief executive also, from a, from a governance perspective, gave us that permission to try and potentially occasionally to fail. So this is not a fail. This is a success as we see it at this stage. This is a particular project about learning disability uh, and included in that, of course, autism and Asperger's. Interestingly, it's led for us as anchor by our EDI team and the head of EDI. So that's the inclusion part of our thought. But also we have Essex County Council and South Essex College helping to identify and support what are at times some young people who have not had the best of opportunities. And we want to help to provide that. So initially the programme was for 12 young people a series of rotations around different departments so that they experienced all parts of the, the health world of work, should we say. And actually, interestingly, what we found out, and perhaps not surprisingly on reflection, some of those young people didn't want to move after their first rotation. It was about them feeling settled and happy and comfortable. And we worked with that to try to ensure that we met their needs as much as we might be thinking about the genesis of the actual programme. Absolutely delighted that we have other partners at ICS level beginning to replicate and learn from us and that we've been able to expand that out of Basildon to our two other hospitals, Southend and Chelmsford. And that for an FT of this size is one of the challenges in terms of trying to scale up activity out of one hospital to another and then across a whole ICS patch. And our ICS patch is coterminous with our hospital um, geography as well. So that's quite helpful. Next slide, please. So I don't want to say this is the jewel in the crown. What I will say is this is our award winner currently. Um, UK CRF is levelling up in all but name. It was a precursor fund to what we now understand as UK Share Prosperity Fund. We were very fortunate to receive an, an award via Confed probably about a month ago now, time flies on, for an outstanding contribution to population health. But really the story of South End, and when we put the slides out, I'm not going to play the video, but listen to the infographic. It's two minutes. It tells you all about the programme. But for us, it was about us using our strength as hospital to leverage external funding. As a programme, we are opportunistic. I'll use a better phrase, perhaps, 
uh, unashamedly entrepreneurial in trying to make the best use of the opportunities that come our collective partnership way. So UK CRF went to 100 quite limited um, geographies across the whole UK. Uh, and it was very much a focus on disadvantaged areas and disadvantaged places in that context and therefore disadvantaged people. So what have we done? We put together an employment program that is based on an existing supported employment model, but includes intensive individual support. It includes a blend of virtual and in-person support. It's tailored and intensive in its intensity and appropriate to the individual's need. So it's led by the participants. It's about their goals, not necessarily how many vacancies that we might particularly have at any one time that we want to fill. Although, of course, all of that does help. But importantly, um, we have a mix of providers. So as NHS, we have our anchor employment support officers, but we also have a range of community partners. And the real keys to the door, as it turned out, was one of our partners, South Essex Community Hubs. It's a bit like a citizen's advice bureau, but you know what? It's at the centre of the city in South End. Our hospital is almost two miles out of the city centre, and our cohort target group would not travel to see us there unless there was a very good reason. So we've largely delivered our service through and with a third party voluntary community sector organisation, which equally has enabled us to reach a large numbers and exactly the right cohort. So the numbers beat all of the targets that we put down. We never actually expected to get people into work, but it's great that we have done. It's probably moved on every day. It seems to shift upwards. But equally, we have to be critical of ourselves and the 37 other sector starts are often because we simply can't get people on boarded in the timescales that they needed the need there for those communities and those individuals is to earn money and earn money immediately, given the, the sum total of the crisis that's around the corner for us. So I've got a couple more slides. I hope I've gained back a little bit more time, but if we can just move on. So the other part of our journey around inclusion and employment is our anchor youth partnership. And that's very much um, a sense of learning on what happened in South End or what has happened in South End as we draw to the end of that particular pilot and our better understanding of how we support communities and how we create life chances through wealth and opportunity. So this particular piece of work is funded by NHS England through the Health Foundation and the Health Anchors Learning Network. And what we quickly came to realise that there was an additional layer of need for a cohort that had particularly had a difficult experience potentially through their lives to date. And that was about trying to ensure that we were strengthening and opening up points of access to employment for our 16 to 24 year olds who have faced perhaps multiple challenges. But as an example, if you're a young adult carer, we're very familiar with the concept of carer's passports and providing flexible working arrangements to um, people who care for children and people who care for older uh, relatives. But actually, you know, that young person may not quite want to make that ask and they may feel stigmatised in doing it. So it was both opening up the routes to those people that charged with supporting adults around, um, around their employment needs, but also really firmly understanding those additional layer of needs that could impact upon people. And we have a mantra in our trust, as I'm sure many of you do, about being able to bring your whole self to work. The third part of that story, and hopefully by the new year, we'll be able to, through Health Anchors Learning Network, put that forward, is to develop a, a methodology that other anchors could adopt to replicate the practice. Next slide, please. So this is sort of, um, it's easy for me because I'm somewhat familiar with the areas. It's not intended that you'll be able to, uh, at a quick glance, understand all of this. But this is really the, the, the zoom out of our tool. You can get in really closely with this particular tool. It's about mapping what's there, but really importantly, mapping the connections and how services interact and work with each other. And so you can select, so you can determine this by place, by micro place, or by theme, say, employment or how close um, you are to the end of um, to the criminal justice system, for instance. And there's information um, on each particular provider, organisational project 
uh, as you click over it. So a final slide from me, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and earlier on, uh, our colleague identified you know, how we were assessing it social value wise. So for us, our approach is how do we find a way of transmitting this information and the associated value that goes with it because that's the challenge often from clinicians well you know that's a 10 or 20 year process i've got this as a challenge at the moment and so we've used an essex county council social value framework <coughs> excuse me to extrapolate um, some of those numbers into a proximate value and we've also taken the approach that and my job title says that local value lead as opposed to social value lead it's not only the specifics that we offer it's the wider stuff that a trust does so the value that all of our apprenticeships all of our time upskilling people to earn more money to be healthier and wealthier in their in is part of our overarching social value and it enables us to recirculate the money and keep as much of it in Essex as we reasonably can be expected to do so so I'm going to end there I think there are probably some chat questions Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, we've probably got room for one question. Um, if anyone has got anyone wants to raise their hand, or I will take chair's prerogative. I guess really, Kevin, my 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 question is is that where do you start, particularly if you're kind of new on this journey? What would your what would you say to what would your older self say to your younger self for starting this journey? Where to start? I suppose I'll do that at a personal level <clears throat> at one point and then give you the, the organisational view. I think there's a bit about getting your feet wet and trying some things and occasionally taking a deep breath and occasionally going into a meeting, turning your, your kind of motivation, trying to think, actually, I think the point I always reflect on, and nobody has actually yet said no to me. So I kind of go on dreading the day when someone say, no, we really can't do that, Kevin. Um, so it's that sense of being able to push some boundaries. But what you need is the enablement and the support to do that. So I'm very fortunate that we have a, a main board director as our SRO and we have a broad range of support and we've built internally across the hospital and with partners an alliance of like-minded people. They might not get every bit of it all of the time, um, but we have an anchors institution uh, grouping that meets monthly that is consultative information providing. It's not all about us. Um, and it's very much a sense of we have about 45 different organizations across Mid-South Essex, probably 90 odd people who not every month, but quite regularly engage with that, that grouping. So it's about drawing people towards us and success builds success. So, yeah. So I think that, yeah, that's certainly something about, it. it's it's like a social movement. How do you harness that collective will? Muscat, can I just bring you in um, before we just move to the next session? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Donna, coming here, I'm much richer knowing what I've heard from both trusts and uh, the best thing, giving every child the best start in life. Child is born prestige, clean, there's nothing wrong. It's our nurture and, and the resource and the uh, child just need about one thing I want to ask both the trust, both of them, Roshini and uh, Kevin, how your trusts are in the eyes of CQC and the staff survey and the experience of the service user and the carer, their feedback, they are the more important. And then I can share it to my own trust. So thank you. Thanks. Could I ask colleagues to put links into the chat to answer that question? Because I think we should be able to send to you certainly the CQC ratings and staff survey links, because it's, it's a, a simple question that's sometimes quite hard to answer. <laughs> but we can follow that up in email if that's all right, because I think you think you're right, because what you want to, be able to do is go back to your own trust to say, actually, this isn't by compromising um, care. This is not an add on. This is part of the process, which I know colleagues will be able to answer if that's OK. This is the point where we all now pray, pray to the IT gods because I'm going to ask um, Lee to attempt to play a video um, from my own organisation, which is just to bring it down to an individual level. So I'd like to introduce you to, um, to Jacob, who is interviewing um, our chief exec, Dr. Owen Williams. Lee, over to you.
if you were talking to somebody who was thinking about becoming an intern, what might you say to them? Um, I'd recommend it to them. Yeah, you recommend it as a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think it's helped you? Yeah, it's helped confidence. Yeah, confidence and stuff like that. Um, Lee, it's it's very quiet if you're able to turn it up at all. That would be great. Mm -hmm. And then some days it's quiet. Yeah, yeah. So what do you actually do? Um, Well, I have to deliver the orders by the housekeeper's order. And then I have to make sure it's the right delivery. Yeah, yeah. For the department. Yeah. And are are there any wars where it's harder to do that than others? Sometimes, but I've learned them. Yeah, what what what's helped you? What do you think you've learned to help work through some of that? Um, going with other people and see how they do it. All right, okay, yeah. So, um, it's not just a question of um, you on your own. Mm-hmm. It's quite important that the support that you get to kind of help you learn the job. That's quite important as well. Mm-hmm. All right, okay. Yeah. So we we need to think about that, don't mm-hmm. we? Um, to make sure that we've got. Yeah. Um, people who will support and, and help mm-hmm. um, and, 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 and work that through with you. So, yeah. what do you like about your job? So, you know, Jacob, the, the one thing I like about my job is people, yeah. mm-hmm. working with people. So, whether they're um, patients they're or patients. friends and relatives of patients, or whether they're the colleagues, a bit like you're doing now, mm-hmm. who play a part in looking after our patients it's just great being around people and um, one of the things I try and do um, is to make sure that um, the colleagues that we work with, both of us work with that they've got an opportunity to be the best of what they want to be mm-hmm. you know, regardless of what their background is what their circumstances Can. are The great thing about this job is being able to, I would say, support, serve people um, to be the best of what they want to be. So it's great. Love it. Why do you think supported internships are important? I mean, mean important. The easy answer will be just to say, just look at this and how you feel. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the things about, for me, about how we provide care to our communities that we serve Jacob is our communities are very very diverse um, in backgrounds in all kinds of things and I'm a real passionate believer that regardless of who you are and what your circumstance is everybody should have opportunity yeah Mm -hmm. and um, the internship for me really is a, a satellite example and you know a real shining example okay. of um, the sorts of things that an organization like ours should be doing to work with people and our communities and I think you said Jacob that you live reasonably close by yeah yeah I don't live too far yeah so th- there's also that bit as well Jacob about um, it's not just about health care or it's about the role we play because you know this this yeah. hospital that we're in now for example it, it's not my hospital mm-hmm. it belongs to the community and therefore what we do together shouldn't be just about healthcare it should also be about helping people whether it's through okay. work you know whether it's through you know housing or whatever it is um, that should be a part of our role so that's why this really is important well, that's to say thank you to David and Val. Yeah, we're seeing this abuse and it was a fan yeah. as well. They are, they are superb. Yeah. They're, they're fantastic it's in our programme. Since the start, um, the so 10 good. years ago, yeah. the receipt and distribution team, year after year, support the interns. Thank you very much. I hope people had a chance to, to, to hear that. I think it was just really important because one of the things within the healthcare alliance is we really prioritize lived experience i thought it's just important to hear jacob's 
Jacob's story in his own his own words. Um, and I think it, I was really struck by um, Owen's reflections about this is not his hospital, this is the community. It's a community asset, which I know we picked up early on in the discussion. And I think that flows nicely into the next presentation um, from Lucy, who has taken this a step further by physically moving services onto the high streets. So if I could hand, hand over to Lucy. Thanks so much, Donna, and thanks for inviting me today. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lucy Gardner, and I'm Director of Strategy and Partnerships from Warrington and Holton Hospital. I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that we're working with our communities on to create um, health on the high street. Um, if I could have my slides, please, Neil, that'd be great. Thank you. It's lovely to see that we've got someone else from Warrington as well on the call. So hi to Jerry. Um, and also just to let you know that I am currently um, in Coin Street Neighbourhood Centre. So uh, there might be a little bit of background noise as people are setting up for this afternoon. Um, so we just start by saying a little bit about where I work in Warrington and Holton, because I'm conscious that perhaps not everyone on the call is familiar with Warrington and Holton. So from an integrated care system perspective, we sit within Cheshire and Merseyside. Um, and you can see um, geographically, Warrington Holton, we're essentially between Liverpool and Manchester. Um, there's some stats there on screens in terms of the levels of deprivation, not just within Cheshire and Merseyside, um, but also importantly within Warrington and Holton themselves. So in both boroughs, in both Warrington and Holton, there is a 10 year gap in life expectancy within the borough. Um, Holton also is ranked 39th out of 307, 317 local authority areas in terms of the index of multiple de deprivation. And again, in both areas, we're expecting our 65 plus population to triple in the next 20 years. I could have the next slide, please, Neil. Thank you. Um, just a little bit more in terms of um, Holton specifically, as it is a significantly deprived area. I'm not going to go through everything that is on this slide, just pull out a few of the key points um, and things that kind of motivate me every day in my role, um, because I think that it's unacceptable that we can kind of together allow some of this to continue. So um, a baby born in Holton is 33% more likely to be stillborn. Um, in childhood, um, children are 60% more likely to be severely obese. Um, and then in adolescence, 90% more likely to be admitted to hospital for alcohol related reasons, for example. Um, and in adulthood, 90% more likely to be admitted to hospital for a violence related reason. Um, and then in older age, um, probably the key one to pull out there is that 47% more likely to die from a cause that is considered preventable. A female baby that's born in Holton has a healthy life expectancy of only 57 and a half years, so significantly below the national average. So some quite stocking, shocking statistics in terms of the populations and communities um, where I work and that we serve. If I could have the next slide, please, Neil. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to share um, a really, really brief overview in terms of three of our key projects around creating health on the high street with our communities. Um, and the first of those is Warrington Living Well Hub, which is due to open in the summer of 2023. Um, the Living Well Hub is going to be based in um, currently vacant retail space in Warrington Town Centre. Um, clearly based on some of the previous information that I've just shared, um, its main purpose is to target at addressing that 10 year gap of in life expectancy within borough. And from a service perspective, it will um, provide a huge range of services from across at least five providers, including the voluntary sector mm -hmm. um, and including physical and mental health and wellbeing and support services. Um, some of our biggest challenges for our communities um, in Warrington, and particularly in the centre of Warrington, which is where this will be based, um, are within our children and families, and also those adults that may not yet be experiencing some of the challenges of frailty, but are on the edge of that in terms of if we don't work together and to support them in terms of some of the prevention activities that they could do, um, that they may tip into that um, for example, things like falling, memory loss, 
Um, so people who have perhaps not yet experiencing some of those things, but are likely to unless um, they look after themselves or with support from other organisations, including ourselves. One of the key things is as well that the space will be really flexible. Um, so Donna talked before about the importance um, of health creation and, for example, in, in communities being able to have a space where they can meet and support each other and also be able to therefore take control of some of their own health and well-being. Um, so that kind of informal space is really important. Important, um, as is the flexibility um, of the space and we're, we're making sure that we're able to respond as we go through as well to specific requests from the community so for example we are going to include mm -hmm. um, washing machines and shower facilities for care leavers who have said they'd really like a space to come and be able to meet to support each other but it'd be really helpful because often when they first leave care they don't have anywhere to wash their clothes it'd be really helpful if for example there were washing machines so Yes, we'll absolutely be providing kind of core health services, but it will be much more than that. Um, just shared there some of the planned benefits um, from this um, Warrington Living Well Hub along the side. I won't read um, all of those out. Um, one of the key things is around the annual users. So we expect there to be 30,000 annual users by the second year. Now that's important, not just in terms of the benefits um, that those individuals should experience from accessing the hub itself, but also in terms of the town centre footfall and thus um, kind of the preservation of the town and jobs. Um, in terms of funding, um, we've been able to um, part fund this. Um, we're really fortunate to secure um, three million pounds via the Town Deal programme, which is essentially a national levelling up programme that 100 towns have benefited from. Um, we have an ongoing challenge between ourselves and other partners in terms of covering the additional revenue costs, which you can see there we're predicting to be about 270,000 um, pounds. If I could have the next slide, please. Thanks, Neil. Um, this is probably quite hard to see because I've included some small pictures and at this stage we've just got detailed plans in terms of what the hub will look like. Um, you can see there kind of on the left the picture from the outside. Um, what's key about this I guess is the informal space and it um, feeling welcoming when people come in. So that kind of top left um, diagram there. Um, is, is meant to be kind of informal kind of reception space with a cafe, for example, so that people feel really welcome to come in, even if they're not coming for a specific appointment. Um, we've also included some green space on the roof in terms of a rooftop garden. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Neil? Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna move on to our second um, project, which is the Runcorn Health and Education Hub. And you'll notice there, it says awaiting final business case approval. Well, what is really good news is that it was actually just approved by um, the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities on Monday. So I can now say it's approved, which is really exciting. Um, so this is similar, although quite different as well to the Living Well Hub. It's similar in terms of it's also funded um, via the National Town Deal programme. However, it's focused specifically around the community within Runcorn and there are some key differences in terms of the needs um, in Runcorn versus Warrington. Um, so given that there's a specific um, focus on education and access to employment as well as health, which is really important. Um, a focus on long term conditions as well as children and families because respiratory conditions in particular um, are a real challenge um, for people living in that part of Holton and Runcorn. Um, and again, I've, I've tried to summarise some of the benefits that we're aiming to deliver um, through this hub, which include benefits, obviously, to the communities themselves, to the town centre in terms of regeneration, access to employment, um, but also kind of important in terms of being able to secure funding and prioritisation from a hospital perspective is a reduction um, to in hospital admissions as well um, through that more preventative approach to healthcare. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, Neil, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and again, we've got some pictures in terms of what we're anticipating this to look um, like. And Mustak earlier raised a point around community facilities. And within here, we very much will have um, a place where community groups can come and use that space. Um, I don't know if you can see, but in the bottom left hand picture, there's kind of a big um, grey rectangle um, that will be um, a really open space that could be used for example for local community groups to have exercise classes but also just to meet and have conversations and kind of that community level support. Um, 
so really exciting. Uh, the top um, left hand picture is there'll be a whole floor that is dedicated um, to education and access to employment as well. And similarly to the Warrington one, the intention is that it's really welcoming a space that people can just walk into as well as come to for specific appointments. Um, thank you. Could I have the next slide, please, Neil? Thank you. And our final one, which I'll be able to show you real pictures because it's actually uh, finished, which is very exciting. Um, so this um, Holton Health Hub was very much our kind of first foray into health on the high street. Um, it's based in Runcorn Shopping City, which is a really incredibly important community asset um, for the local community. So it's, imagine it's a really big old shopping centre built in the 1970s. And um, it was actually opened by the Queen in May 1972. Um, it's really struggling, as are a lot of shopping centres, but is a really key place, not just for people to access shops and indeed to gain employment, but for them to meet and talk and have that social interaction and contact, um, which is really important. Um, so initially, um, we're planning to provide kind of outpatient services where people need to access them really often, but they're kind of um, a low intensity of kind of interaction required in terms of not a lot of clinical equipment, um, but appointments that people would need um, often um, and regularly. Um, so they include um, ophthalmology, audiology and dietetics outpatient services in the first instance. However, we have been working really closely with our local community and one of the best days I spent was talking to everyone um, who was passing by in, in Shopping City, um, had some really valuable and interesting conversations um, around what's really, really important to people. And a couple of the things that came out of that uh, was also access to primary care and blood tests, for example. So so we're working really closely with our GP partners and are hoping to provide um, primary care enhanced access um, from the hub as well. Um, from a health perspective, um, initially it will deliver about 8,000 um, appointments per year, um, which is really important in terms of if we reflect back on the impact of COVID in terms of NHS waiting times, because 3,000 of those appointments are additional. It will help us to reduce long waits for um, some of those specialties, um, but also will increase footfall by about 150 people a week um, to the shopping centre, really important in terms of preservation of that community asset, and also kickstart the wider physical regeneration of that um, shopping centre, which is considered a, a town centre really um, to, the, to local communities. Um, we'll actually be based um, next to some other charitable sector organisations as well, um, which is really exciting in terms of us being able to work really closely together. Um, we had a slightly different funding source for this in terms of we secured some initial kind of startup funding via um, the Liverpool City Region Town Centre Fund. And perhaps one of the things that's been most difficult following that is um, gaining and securing capital investment via our own acute trust capital programme um, to supplement that initial funding that we've secured. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> um, I think there's a slide missing, but that's okay. <laughs> Don't worry, Neil. Um, there is, um, there were some very pretty pictures, <laughs> um, which I'm happy to share separately, which I'm personally very excited about because they actually show the finished, what was essentially a vacant retail unit turned into um, a health centre. Um, and then there's also just one that's missing that's around um, some of the challenges, because I think it's been really, really challenging to get to this point um, on all three of those projects. Um, and I think when Donna invited me um, to share some of our experience today, I felt that it was really important to do that because I think Donna also mentioned that sometimes it can feel a little bit lonely, can't it, when you're trying to take forward um, something that can be perceived particularly in acute hospital trust as something that might not be our core business or might be a bit different or a bit risky, but that is really important. Oh, thanks, Neil. You can That's see right. the pictures now. <laughs> Excellent. Um, but that is so important in terms of um, health creation. And actually, I think we all really have a role in health creation, whether we work for an acute trust or in healthcare elsewhere, or to be honest, as individuals. Um, so it has been really challenging. And I think that if we can share 
what we're doing and help anyone else who's facing some of the same challenges then um, that's what I'd really love to do because I think that together we can make a massive difference. Um, Neil, if I could have the next slide, please, that'd be great. Um, so just down the left-hand side are some of the challenges that we have faced. Um, and I th what I hope, going back to kind of some of the earlier presentations as well, and I think Tom mentioned that um, there's a hope really, isn't there, that the new governance in terms of the integrated care systems, and, and from my perspective, importantly, the place-based structure will really help us to overcome some of the issues because a lot of them lie with um, working across multiple organizations in order to provide a new facility um, and new services um, in a different location so a lot of those challenges I hope will be addressed going forwards by the new national governance that's been put in place um, but I guess I wanted to finish really by saying despite the challenges I think it's it's just so worth it because the impact is potentially huge in terms of town centre regeneration, addressing that gap in life expectancy, which I don't think any of us can accept or allow to continue, um, increased education and employment, and kind of one of the key factors in terms of business case, I guess, reducing demand on statutory services like RA and E, um, that's at capacity. And then also we've touched on earlier as well, kind of the physical estate regeneration and preservation of community assets. And I guess most importantly, supporting the communities um, that we work in and that we serve and indeed live in um, to be healthy and happy and thriving. Um, um, and could I just have the final slide? Thanks, Neil. Um, so these are just some of the many partners that we've been working with um, around creating health on the high street. Um, and we absolutely couldn't have done it without all of these partners and with our local communities. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. I just struggled to get off, off mute there. I'm just really conscious of time. So I'm going to ask if people can pop their questions in the chat and we'll respond um, directly. I think there's quite a few technical questions around funding, et cetera, that I think we'll probably need a, a fuller answer than we probably can do over, uh, during the time we've got. Because as we said at the beginning, this is about a call for action. So we're now going from listening um, and enthusiastic mode into, into kind of uh, the call for action. And I'm, I'm delighted to, uh, to invite our two final uh, speakers who are uh, Michael Ward, who's Head of Health Economics at the NHS Confed, and Sarah Price, particularly thank you to Sarah, who's uh, stepped in, um, to who is the Chief Officer for Health and Equalities and Deputy Chief um, Exec at NHS Greater Manchester Integrated Care. What I'm keen we do in this discussion is to really think about, in our new architecture, how do how does health creation become more, more business as usual? So if I could ask our, our speakers to maybe spend two to three minutes reflecting on that and for the audience to be ready because you all have got a job is to really to start putting into the chat what are you going to do now what is your action as a consequence of of this of this session so to you Michael first and then to Sarah Michael yeah thanks Donna and hi everyone and Sarah and I've got a slot called a call to action well, I think the whole two hours of this has been a call to action quite simply I work nationally for NHS Confederation I also advise NHS London on an anchor network and I've been doing a bit of work looking at that fourth purpose of an ICS and I thought before I come on to one point I just want to reference some quotes which are non-NHS people around that round table Donna mentioned to us because I think they're really interesting they make us resonate the first one was NHS leaders lack curiosity they don't ask about why things are why they are. How fascinating if not asking why things are. Will the NHS push where and when really needed? And there's a bit of suspicion about that. Collaborative place leadership is too often seen as a challenge to the NHS rather than an opportunity for it. Really interesting that some of our universities, our local government colleagues, or you know, our colleges, our VCSE, our industry partners think this. And the last one I'll just say is, the NHS doesn't understand its knock on effects in other sectors. For example, on skills, we might end up skewing the labour market and competing rather than looking at how we make our place productive. So, Donna, I just wanted to have those there at the back of our mind, as that's what some of our partners think. And I just want to come on to the anchor journey. We've heard some fantastic stuff today. We've heard how it's both hugely strategic and it's hyper local. And very few of our agendas can do both of those and keep that echo between the two. What I want to talk about is 
we, we haven't finished the anchor journey. We've only just begun on it. And I think, how can we, if we bring systems into place, I think, where is the value of systems? And I think it's really interesting we think about that from a position, not just what systems should do, where can they add value? Well, the anchor journey for, for many of us started within an institution, didn't it? An institutional view. And actually, it's learning about ourselves. But no matter how big the institution, we only have a partial view from within that institution. So actually, what I'm really interested by is how systems will grasp the, the, the path to an anchor system where they can look across the piece at all the different institutions within that patch. Look at the current issues, prevailing economic winds and social fluency and a coherent civic picture of that place and actually begin to understand where we might want to change and to reflect that back to our institutions. And I think that's a really interesting bit, Donna. There needs to be an echo between us. It's not about you do this, you do this, you do this. Everyone's got a different part to play in that. But how can we challenge what is naturally a bit of institutional blindness that comes from being within four walls? And the system with the knowledge of the hinterland can start to let us know, Donna, what it is we should want to change. And that's because that brings us to decentralization, doesn't it? Decentralization means we start from a different, we all start from different places. We should all be fighting to understand what it is we want to change and understanding how to harness the power of our institutions within the NHS, but also from outside the NHS to try and help us do that. So I'm going to leave it there for now, Donna, and pass to Sarah, but really open to any questions and thoughts. Thank you. Sarah, over to you. Uh, thanks, Donna, and thanks, Michael. Um, I think one of the, um, picking up on the point about uh, challenging our, our institutions, that, that using what, what ICSs bring to, um, to our structures um, is something that we can really build on. So the purposes of an ICS, um, apologies if someone's already mentioned this this morning, are to improve the outcomes in population health and healthcare. And the change to the acute license and things that are going to come out um, as we move forward are all going to push us in the direction of taking that much broader responsibility for whole populations. You know, the ICS model is built very much on that accountable care organisation uh, approach in America. Where, you, where, where the benefits, um, if you look at places like Montefiore in the Bronx in New York, where they understood that if they could get the incentives lined up correctly, they would reduce the pressure on their organisations by making the population as a whole healthier. So when the weather was really hot, they were buying fans to take out to their vulnerable patients and, and to make sure that they weren't overheating and having to come into hospital because of collapsing, etc. So, so I mean, over the pandemic, I think we really have started to see organisations begin to understand how working in a whole system approach will mean that they can see an improvement in terms of how things work and what happens. You know, all our organisations are part of the system. We've got some fantastic primary care networks and practices that are really embracing this agenda. We've got some, um, as, as you've heard from um, uh, the Northern Care Alliance, we've got some fantastic, organ huge organisations taking on this agenda. But not everyone's going to do that. So the structures that the ICS allows us to use is going to help create the incentives for people to see this as part of their business. And I think the call to action is we need ICSs to really drive that home. That fourth um, requirement of ICSs, which is to help the NHS support broader social and economic development, has got to be owned and really developed. Um, again, fantastic examples of where people are doing it, but we've got to um, ensure that, that people see that broader responsibility. And, you know, I would say this, wouldn't I, because I come from this background, but looking at those wider determinants of health, we are going to get those benefits in the longer term. And, and even in the shorter term, you start to see, um, you know, staff sickness rates can go down because people feel um, um, that they're uh, valued, um, their communities, they're coming from their local communities. And um, it can become a really virtuous circle, um, having a good job. Um, having um, a strong educational support um, making sure that you're living in the right kind of housing. Um, uh, it, it can all take pressure off our system as a whole and owning that in the longer term through our five year strategies, et cetera, going forward, I think is something that, that, that we can all benefit from. Um, you know, prevention's better than cure, bit, bit of an old sop, but actually still as true as it ever was. So um, ensuring that, that we've got the incentives aligned um, to bring those along that perhaps 
aren't as enthusiastic as some of our leading lights, I think is the role of the ICS. And I think we're in a really strong position to be able to do that going forward. Thanks, Sarah. Can I just, just pick up on, the, on, on that last point that you made about, because obviously we're seeing a new NHS architect um, and the, there is still the little cynic voice in me that says, so what's new in this real, this set of governance arrangements that really mean that health creation around that long term, you know, the, the kind of shifting of power to communities and how, what, what, what do you feel you've got now as a ICS leader that you haven't had in previous regimes or what would you like to see? So, so, so I think those four that, you know, the four, the quadruple aim or whatever we're calling it for, um, for the um, ICSs require us to take responsibility for improving health and care outcomes, for reducing inequality, and yes, improving services for people um, and making them affordable, sustainable, but also, as I say, contributing to that economic regeneration of our, of our areas. And, you know, I think the ICSs are in a really strong position to be able to do that by um, uh, bringing the system together and drawing on all those um, opportunities across the whole of public sector, community voluntary sector, um, uh, and communities and individuals in a way um, that we're going. I, the conversations that I hear today, I wouldn't have heard even two years ago. You know, people understanding what their roles and responsibilities are around um, uh, uh, the populations that they sit within in terms of their organisations remember um, very many decades ago talking to a head of midwifery about um, the, the state of the um, uh, conditions that they were discharging women who just had babies into, into bread and breakfast accommodation etc. I think we'd have a different conversation today about the responsibility that we have around the population as we um, look past the doors of the hospital or look past the doors of our services and working with our colleagues at a very local level within those neighbourhoods, um, integrating at that level, being able to understand what the um, options are for individuals and what support we can wrap around them, I think is going to start to make a really big difference. Thanks, Sarah. Can I ask Michael to make uh, kind of maybe reflections on the same point and then I'll look out for hands if anyone else would like to come in. Yeah, absolutely, Donna. And, and what I would say, really interesting learning from our NHS London work is, is, is we are moving at the pace of our partners. So actually, you know, we, we, workforce has been a, a long-standing challenge, of course, for many in the health and care sector. Actually, it's by showing the mayor a bit of commitment and working with the mayor. Now, the mayor, we've set up in each ICS in London a health and social care academy. It's the mayor's money. It's the mayor's branding. It's the mayor's reach. He is better placed to lead on reaching communities that we traditionally do not uh, recruit from than the NHS is. And actually, it's taken the anchor work in London to move a conversation between the NHS and the mayor about reconfiguring to being about jobs, 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 about the, the people that he represents, the people that make up that nine million of London. So actually, often the biggest surprise for people in the NHS is that it's our partners that will determine how quickly we work and the success we have and what we can change. It doesn't, it's not just within our service. And we have to show that, and all the examples today show that, to convince our colleagues that actually it is worth looking outwards and talking uh, with our partners and with the people that collectively represent and serve the communities. Thanks, Michael. Brian, have you got a question? Yes, um, thanks. I put it in the chat. It's for Sarah. And it's you mentioned the incentives in the Bronx that, that people, the incentives were changed to shift the focus of work. And I'm wondering what those incentives were, where, where we could find out about them, because I'm increasingly interested in the idea that we might need to shift incentives across the NHS to encourage the uptake of health creation and to make sure that health creation is really um, business as usual across the system. So I'm, I'm intrigued to know what other incentives have been used elsewhere. So, so some of the things that they were using in a, there are around how you save money by making care um, or bringing care to the cheapest possible level. So by being more preventative early intervention approach, you um, make care cheap because you are less reliant on hospital care. So, so it, it was very um, financially driven, I think, initially. But I think the benefits that accrue to what was a very deprived population um, meant that 
Um, they could do things like start to um, provide preventative programs, um, physical activity, you know, gyms and all of those kinds of things because they were able to provide things more cheaply and that those did have a payback in terms of reduction in, in service use. And I think the same applies here. So, so, you know, not in quite the same way, but if um, the way that money flows through the new system means that um, there is uh, an opportunity for um, us to get more upstream in the sort of um, support that we offer to our communities. And by working in partnership, we can look at, you know, how do we work with leisure providers and incentivize people to go to leisure providers, um, make people feel like they belong and are um, uh, encouraged to access those things through social prescribing, etc. Then, then there is the opportunity to try to um, do both primary and secondary prevention and ultimately reducing demand for both health and social care services. You know, we know what the evidence on reablement looks like. You know, if we were really um, investing in reablement, um, uh, we could reduce the number of people um, going re readmitted to hospital, but also going into long term care. One of the things that's disincentivized us in the past is who does the benefit accrue to? You know that that uh, uh, you know unless the money came back into the NHS, we didn't see the benefit of it. But with this, you know, when you look more broadly, the NHS does benefit, but but it doesn't necessarily come back in cash releasing savings that you're going to get in a year's time, which is the traditional model that we've looked at. So understanding those wider benefits, those wider incentives, perhaps to change, I think, is going to help us move forward. Thank you. I think that's a, a really solid um, kind of uh, thought for us to think about in terms of it's how do we think about what incentives we've got to not just look at the here and now, but to lift our heads to look at, you know, how, you know the, the work that um, Elf talks about, about, you know, that every every child has a good start in life. You know, that that is that is going to not solve A&E's crisis this afternoon, but potentially is for the next generation. We need to be able to to have that that foresight. And um, as we as we draw to a close, um, I did ask people just, and I've seen some lovely comments in, in, the, in the chat, but really for me, uh, you know, doing this work, particularly if you're in an, an organization that is just starting in this, it can feel a bit isolating. So there's something about we're now with like-minded tribe here. What, what are you inspired to do? Is it someone you want to have a conversation with? Is it you're going to just, you know, have a go and ask that curious to use Michael's um quotes to use that curiosity to ask ask that question and um, just as as we come to a close and I make my final comments just just let's just chat put that in the chat just to just to capture that and to keep that aspiration going so um as we draw to a close I just want to do say a massive thank you to our our speakers um it's been a really brilliant uh, two hours um uh, it's been an absolute privilege uh, to 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 chair and to bring people together Please do keep the chat going. I've seen people are are sharing their email. Um, if we were together, this is where we'd move into coffee and we would carry on. Um, so so thank you for that. Um, just to, just to say a final thank you to our speakers um, and to our participants for you all coming to our sponsors who are PPL, Solis, South Central West, Novartis, NHS Property Services. HLMM Architects, as well as uh, the Healthcare Alliance patrons, Lord Victor Abuwali and Lord Nigel Crisp. Thank you for your interest and for coming. And again, if you're not a member, please do uh, sign up. It's free to join um, THCA and we look forward to, to meeting you again at other sessions. For those who are coming this afternoon, I can't wait. There's some people who have been talking about this for two years. I've not met yet, so I'm delighted to see some people in person later on. Um, and for the rest of you, have, a, have the rest of a, of a great day. Please do the evaluation. So I'm finishing a few minutes early so you have time to fill in that evaluation. Thank you very much, everyone.